there almost was n- no other male being that I had ever known with the, the sensibility and feeling for other people that he had. I first met Michael Brecker when I was, I would say, eight, seven, yeah, 18 probably, and which means he was 15. And, um, I, you know, I went to college in Philadelphia in Center City, what is now, it's now known as the University of the Arts. When I went, it was called the Philadelphia Musical Academy, and it's been expanded. In fact, I think now it's the, I think it's the largest uh university of arts in our country at the moment so michael you know went to cheltenham high school in philadelphia and his dad as you know of course leonard was a pianist a very talented pianist and an attorney and i was you know i was busy and very active in in the city michael's dad um I guess, you know, at the time, well, I not a guess, knew of me because I was doing things in the city. And I, was, and I was also doing a lot of things for the Collegiate Jazz Festival circuit. He would take little Michael at 15 to hear me play, you know, and we got to know each other. He was a kid at that time, of course. I was a kid, but he was really a kid at that time. So... When I was 18, Michael was coming to hear me play. When he was 18 (laughs) and I was 21, I was going everywhere I could possibly go to hear him play. You know, so the table shifted, of course. And that's that's when he was really beginning to play the saxophone, you know, even in a semblance of the way he became, you know, later, later in life. So we knew each other, each other at a very young age. Fact, so we go way back, you know, I mean, and then, of course, I remained in Philadelphia for a number of years following that. And every time he would come into town to play, even after he left Indiana and moved to New York, uh, he, would not, he and I would get together and we would trade mouthpieces or reeds or whatever it may be. And I would always go to hear him play. And... I, I, another, you know, facet of now everybody's knowledge about who, who knew Michael and has read about Michael is the the way he would come off of any stage, no matter with whom he was playing, <clears throat> never satisfied with his playing. And I even in the book I read, you know, different guys who have said certain things about that. And I mean, I, I guess as maybe as a psychologist too and my experience and my knowledge what i find is is nothing about what so many people think you know was he always just competing with brandy or was it his dad's you know driving him to be the best i I, for me it's none of that michael brecker for me is a genius is a virtuosic individual a pure virtuoso of the instrument uh and he was driving Michael because he never got to the, the end of what he would attain. I mean, there was just more, no different than what are the way, the way I guess we all, you and I included would look at, you know, John Coltrane. I mean, there's no, no way for we, for us to even really describe that. You know, you you don't practice to become like Michael Brecker. You know, you, no matter who you are, you know, you you if you could practice twenty hours a day, I don't care who you are, you're not going to be Michael Brecker. You're not going to play like Michael Brecker. You know, yesterday I was listening to that performance, one of those performances where he does the solo saxophone thing on Naima, and this the one I was watching yesterday was in Germany in I think it was two thousand two, and you know, you, you know, you don't practice to be to do that. You, you, and Michael practiced even <laughs> all the time to take it to those other technical levels so that he could express what it was that he heard and wanted to bring out, you know. So it, it, it's just phenomenal for me. And, the, and those early years, 
Brett, when, when I would go to hear him, it, when he would come to Philly, whether it was with Horace Silver or, or then with the Breckford Brothers at some of the little, even local clubs, and he would come off of the stage and those of us that were living in Philly at that time, every sax film player that would go to hear him, and he, he'd come over to me and, he'd, and maybe at the bar and he'd say, oh man, God, did I suck at Michael. I, I, most most of the people listening to you would have given a foot or two, uh, not a finger or a hand, but maybe a foot or an, a leg. I mean, to to ever play a solo like that, but you know, it wouldn't mean anything if you gave, <laughs> if you gave your foot or whatever. So they, you know, they were my early experiences with him, and just the rapport that he had for other human beings and that I guess I consider myself to be one of the very fortunate people that he liked. And so there are so many other stories of young guys that he did, did that to even as he got older. But just what he gave to me over the years of staying as a friend and would return my phone calls and he would listen to things that I would play and make you know, good critic, critical comments to me about the most of which were always sweet and, and complimentary, actually, you know. Um, and then, you know, then I, again, as I became 19 and 20, I started to do a lot of those jazz festivals um, all over the country, like Villanova, Notre Dame, uh, Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac, Texas, all those. And Fortunately for me, I will say proudly, I guess, um, I used to win most of them, by the way, you know, best saxophonist, um, best small group. And the guys that were judges then were people like Bob Thiel, Coltrane, you know, pr Coltrane's producer, uh, Stan Kenton, who invited me to play alto in his band when I was, I guess, 22 years old, maybe, you know, and I didn't do it, should have. <laughs> now looking back a little bit, that would have been a, a good move for me, but I was staying in Philly. I was still in school and I was busy in Philly too at that time. You know, Philadelphia had a little run of, of a good little recording business with the Gamble and Huff stuff that was going on here. <clears throat> and I used to do all of that. So I had, I had a, uh, a good run of all that, but I was always, uh, <clears throat> From the time I was 17, <clears throat> I was a New York wannabe, you know, and I, I spent a lot of time running to New York. So I got to hear Michael play as, as I got to be a little older than he got so busy and active in New York. I got to hear him a lot in the city as well as any time that he came to Philadelphia and I was in Philadelphia. But but. You, Brett, some of, the, some of the things that went on for us when we were young, I mean, that just shows his, I guess, sensibility to other pe people. I mean, when he would come into town someday, he would call me and say, hey, Mike, are you going to be in the city today? And I'd say, um, yeah or no, but I would always get in to see him. That meant he was playing in town. And he would say, man, man I, 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 I have this box of reeds and they're all they're all good. And then I opened another box and they seem to be almost all good. And I bought them together. So meet me and meet me at the hotel and I'll give you one of these boxes. You know, people don't do, people don't do stuff like that. I don't care who they are as other saxophone players. You know, I, I think I have a little bit of Mike Brecker in me and maybe I learned from him too, uh, Brett. But I'm one of those people that when I hear a guy play, whether he's less known than I am or supremely known and more than I'll ever be known, I, I write to those people if I, don't e if I don't know them. I send an email if I can get their email address. So I'll send them a text if I can. And I'll say, man, I, you played so beautifully. I listened to this thing that you did today or I was in the audience and so many people over the years have said, nobody, nobody does stuff like that, you know, and, and Michael Brecker did stuff like that. You know, I remember once 
sending him a CD that I did that, that Gamble and Huff produced, which was the first recording I ever made of my own. And to be honest with you, and you know, you'll, you'll know why I'm saying this. I was a little, not embarrassed, that's the wrong word, but I wanted to be like a Michael Brecker clone. Not that I could ever be Michael Brecker, but I wanted to play all jazz. And here I was, I having allowed myself to do like a, wasn't an R&B record. It was like a Kenny G, early Kenny G attempt. Without even thinking about it, I played jazz. So I was mostly alto in those days. And Gamble and Huff gave me this ridiculously beautiful budget. Got some guys to arrange stuff. I had some strings on some stuff. There's some great music in that. And Michael called me when I after I had sent it to him, and he was all over it. And I said, but Mike, it doesn't compare to the stuff you do. He said, don't, don't talk like that. It's, it's good music. And your saxophone playing sounds good. So that's all that matters. Go with it. You know, you're, you're still young. You know, he, he was younger. But I mean, I was still like, you know, I guess 28 years old or 27 years or whatever I was at that time. You know, so that's the kind of guy he was to many people. But but I think I just I never stopped loving the guy for what he was. And did we all want to sound like him? Hell yeah. Did you know, did we all want to sound like train? Hell yeah. But for me, I mean, I still listen to Coltrane every day and I can honestly Without any question, say to you, I still listen to Michael Brecker every day, one place or another, or one way or another. And those things have rubbed off on me in whatever way I'm fortunate enough to be able to have. <laughs>